Amen. So we're in Matthew chapter 14 tonight. Of course, normally we're going through the book of Matthew on Thursday nights. However, for the uh, because it's kind of the Easter holiday coming up, starting around Wednesday and all that, I thought maybe we'd uh, do something a little different on Wednesday night, but I didn't want to fall behind on Matthew, so I thought, why not preach Matthew 14 on a Sunday night? Um, Amen. And of course, this is a little bit of a shorter one. We last two, if you recall, have been 50 plus verses. This is a little bit of a shorter chapter. Yeah. But uh, still a lot of good stuff here, a lot of great doctrine that we can get, a lot of lessons that we can apply from the book of Matthew. So it starts out saying there in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 1, At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus, and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show, do show forth themselves in him. So again, just showing us that Jesus and John the Baptist had something in common, something very similar, that even... Herod here thinks that it's the same guy. He says, this has got to be John the Baptist, right? But what was it that we saw, we talked about earlier, that makes it so... What is it, that similarity that they share with one another? Well, a lot of it was the preaching. You recall when Jesus said, Whom do men say that I am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, or Elias, or one of the prophets. Well, it wasn't because of the way he looked. It was because of what he said, the type of preaching that he did. And again, so just to show us that Jesus was a hard preacher, because we see some of what John preached, some of the hard things that he had to say here as it goes on and says in verse 3, For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. So Herod, you know, when we get out of this, had gone ahead and married uh, his sister-in-law, essentially. Now, I'm assuming there was a divorce there is what probably took place. I think we see that elsewhere in Scripture. But was it what was it you know uh, that that caused him to throw John into prison? Well, it's because John called him on the carpet for it. You know, John didn't beat around the bush. He said, "Look, it's not lawful." For, uh, for John said unto him, "It is not lawful for thee to have her." Now, what does he mean by it's not lawful? He's saying according to God's law, for you to get divorced and then remarry is not lawful. God does not condone it. Yeah. And that message still applies. I mean, we're in the New Testament here. You know, that is the same message that, that's still preached today, that if a person is divorced and remarries, they are committing adultery in the eyes of God. There's no way around that. That's a hard saying. And it's a hard saying today because so many people are divorced. Because so many people have made that mistake, unfortunately. And you know, and if that's you this, uh, tonight, where you've, you know, you've already gotten divorced and you've already gotten remarried, well, just stay married. You know, don't do it again. Don't make that same mistake. I don't want people to get the idea that you're in some kind of, somehow in perpetual adultery, you know, so long as you are married to the second spouse. You know, I believe it's a one-time thing. You need to confess that and, and move on with your life. You know, and it's, and it's an important thing that we don't beat around the bush on this topic. Not for the sake of those that have already made that mistake, but for those that have not. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, when they, they find out about this later, and they say, you know what, if I had known that, I would have stayed married. Yeah. I would have tried to make it work. I would have put more effort into my marriage instead of just taking the easy way out, or what seemed to be the easy way out at the time. So that's why we need to preach it. That, you know, and good on John for doing that, for standing up for the Word of God and telling it like it is, that, that divorce and remarriage is adultery. You know, and, and that's what we need to do. Why? For the sake of those that haven't done it. For the young people coming up, for the, for the people that are newly married, or people who have been married to the same spouse for a long time, that we need to put effort into our marriage and make it work. So, you know, and it kind of goes to show you, well, what was, what was John, or what was the reaction here? You know, it was Herodias' sake. She was the one that was upset. You know, you know, uh, Herod, he, he seems to be a kind of a fan. He heard the fame thereof. He, he wanted to hear from this guy. Yeah. You know, he seemed to kind of like John the Baptist, some of the things he had to say. But what was his reaction? Or what was her reaction, his wife's reaction? Was thrown in prison. You know, we see it gets even worse than that. You know, it just goes to show you that people don't always like hard preaching. And that's something to keep in mind if you're in a church where hard preaching goes on. I mean, praise God for that. We need more of it. You know, and it's really easy to say how much we like hard preaching until it starts to come down at us. Until it starts to call, uh, starts to fall in our lap. You know, we say, oh, well, that one kind of hits kind of close to home. You know, get on somebody else's sin for a while. And I'll amen, I'll amen that sermon. But praise God for a preacher who'll get up and tell the whole counsel of God, yeah. even if it upsets you. You know, because if that happens, you know, that's not somebody just trying to pick on you and make you feel bad. It's it's an opportunity for you to get something right in your life. Amen. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, I, I more than I can count, I couldn't sit here and recollect all the times I've sat in a sermon 
And I mean, I've had preachers get up and preach sermons. I know they have. You know, they, might, they probably didn't say, I'm writing, I'm preaching this specifically for Corbin. I, but I'll tell you what, I was the muse for that <laughs> sermon. I was the inspiration. Well, if Corbin's got this problem, if this is something that's going on with him, I'm sure we might as well preach on it because, because you know, it's very likely that other people have this going on too. And I've had to get up and storm out with, you know, gritting my teeth and go home, clenching the steering wheel a little tighter, and being upset. But at the end of the day, I had to say, he's right. Yeah. He's right. He's right. <laughs> you know, over and over. But you know what? They were right. And, uh, you know, so praise God for preachers like John the Baptist who don't, who don't hold back. That they, they, they preach it even when it's uh, they know it's going to upset people. You know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. You know, rather than you turning on the radio and listening to... I don't know. If I started referencing people, you'd be you'd think I was, you know, we'd be back in the 90s already. So, you know, whatever popular band is out there right now, and uh, you know, you know, you'd say, well, this is enjoyable. You could, you know, tap your, and you could, you know, enjoy the ride a little bit more. But the Bible says it's better for you to put in that preaching CD that's going to rip your face. Yeah. That someone's going to tell you to get right with God. Yeah. That's the better thing to hear. The Bible says, "For the content, for the commandment is a lamp; the law is a light, and the proofs of instructions are the way of life." You want to have a good life. You want to have a happy life. You want to have a life that's pleasing to God, that He can bless. There's going to be some reproofs and instruction along the way to keep you on that right path. There's going to be times in our Christian life when we start to kind of maybe get off the path a little bit. And the preacher's going to get up. The Word of God's going to come. The Spirit of God's going to come, and it's going to say, "Hey, you need to get back on the path here. You're starting to wander out of the way." <clears throat> Let's go ahead and keep moving on here in verse 5. And it says, and when, he, and when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So Herod has it in his mind that he's going to go ahead and just put John the Baptist to death, but he does it. And it's not because he's so you know, holy and righteous and loves God's people. It's because he feared the multitude. He feared the people because of the people thought what they thought of John. They esteemed him very highly. And that just goes to show you that Leaders are often a reflection of the people that they represent. You know, we, we go, oh, our politicians are so wicked, and they are. And they're, and they're corrupt. But what are they really? They're really just a, ref a reflection of the people that voted for them. Yeah. I mean, they're people that came up, came out of citizenry and went into the, into the public office. I mean, they represent people, their values, what they want, their policies. Not, not always. You know, sometimes there's people that are trying to take a stand and do what's right, but by the... the what we see here is that often leaders, they'll do what, whatever the crowd wants, whatever the multitude wants. And, you know, too bad we don't have that multitude today, right? That's not, I mean, it's the same way today. Unfortunately, it's just the multitude that's wrong now. The multitude nowadays, they don't care about John the Baptist. They'd say, go ahead, off with his head, get rid of him. I mean, we see that with our own pastor. I mean, on an international level, I mean, there's government bodies, there's people that are petitioning, there's people that are... You know, starting whole movements, there's government spokesmen that have come out and said, he's not allowed here. Why? Because he preaches the Word of God. Because he says something that we don't like. So, you know, the problem today, unfortunately, is the multitude. The multitudes despise the man of God. Where in John's day, it looks like, at least from what we read here, that, you know, it was they had enough, uh, they, they, they counted him as a prophet, and that caused, you know, uh, Herod there to to hold off and spare John's life. Let's go ahead and move on in verse 6 here where it says, but when Herod's birthday was kept, I mean, this always gets me. Here's a grown man who's, who's throwing a birthday party for himself. <laughs> I mean, at some point you got to say, it's, yeah, I'm 30 whatever, I'm 40 whatever now. You know, it's okay, I don't need a party. You know, just go get a steak dinner, and enjoy, your, enjoy your day, you know. But here, this guy's got to have a huge birthday. Maybe the 50th, right? After, I don't know, what is it, 25, and then maybe one at 30. And then maybe you should just hold off until you get to 50 so you can make it. So. But anyway, uh, when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before him and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. I mean, here's a golden opportunity for this young lady to get whatever she wants. And, you know, she goes to her mom, of course, and says, and she, being before instructed of her mother, said, give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. I mean, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. That's a true statement. I mean, this what a, a, a wicked, 
vengeful, resentful, right. and just bitter individual to have gotten called out for their sin and, and to go so far as it's not enough that John's in prison. She wants his head. And when she's given an opportunity to get whatsoever she wants, she could have gotten that nice new camel, the latest model, <laughs> you know, with the, the nice saddle on it, and the, maybe the one that had the shade over it, you know. She could have gotten whatever she wanted, you know. They didn't have iPods or anything like that back then, but she could have gotten something nice. You know, if she got a tablet, it would have been like an actual stone tablet. I mean, you just read the same thing over and over. She could have gotten whatever she wanted, and what is, what is it that her mom wants? Not the kingdom, not riches, not anything. I mean, what an opportunity if I were to come to you today and say, hey, I'll give you whatever you want. Not that I have much to offer, but say I did. I mean, think of all the things we can get. Think of all the things that we want and desire. And what does she want? She wants his head in a, in a charger, you know, in a basket. And of course, the Bible says in verse 9, and the king was sorry. He was like, whoops, uh-oh, now I've done it. And, and then it goes on and says, nevertheless, you know, he didn't let his feelings get, get too carried away. He must not have felt too bad about it because it says, for the oath's sake, because he had made some foolish vow to this lady. He said he had to carry, he had to uh, follow through with it. And that should tell us that, you know, we should not make oaths, that we should not make things and say things that we might regret. The Bible talks about that, about making vows foolishly. You know, Jesus said, you know, swear not by, by earth, for it is God's foot, footstool, neither by heaven, for it is, his, it is his throne. Thou canst not make one hair of thy head white or black. You know, and let your yea be yea, and your name be nay. But here he is, and this is the kind of trouble that people get into. And he says, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat at me, he commanded it to be given her. Mm -hmm. Now, what would have been the right thing to do here? I think it would have been to break the oath, rather than to go behead a man of God. Right. Or anybody really for that, for that. Yeah. It just doesn't help at all that it was John the Baptist that he did it to. They should probably he probably would have just broke should have broken the oath, in my opinion. And that's why it says there nevertheless for the oath's sake and them that said it me. We see his motive here. It's his reputation that he's worried yeah. about. Yeah. He's not worried about doing the right thing. He's not worried about what people are gonna think. He feared the multitude before, but now that his reputation is on the line with his friends, with all of the, the people that he rubs elbows with, oh, with all of his colleagues and cohorts and his contemporaries, what are they going to think about me? Well, I can't back off now. I have to go ahead and head John. And that's what he what he did. He cared more about his reputation than what was what was right. Verse ten, and he sent and beheaded John in, in the prison. And you know, we think, man, what a tragedy. I mean, think about what I mean. Here's John the Baptist, the man of, which was said of him by Jesus Christ himself that there had not been born among women of a man greater than John the Baptist. And we think about all the potential that John the Baptist could have had, all the more works he could have done for God, all the things that he already had done for God. I mean, a young man, you know, only a few months older than Jesus uh, himself, just getting into the prime of life in his 30s, could have done so many great works for God, but God allows this to take place in his life. I mean, could God not have sent angels into that prison like he did for Paul and others? And, and, and brought them out alive and delivered them? Certainly he could have. But he lets this take place. He lets this go ahead. And, you know, it probably as an example, you know, not only of the stand that John was willing to take, but also how we ought to react. And, and we'll get into that in a minute, but one thing we can learn from this is that, you know, serving God is no guarantee of a happy life. You know, God doesn't have a magic wand, you know, and... and and people, you know, they call, and I, I, I think of people who call the church or people come to you with, you know, difficult circumstances and they want you to just say some magic words that are going to make them feel better about the poor decisions that they've made in life. They've got these consequences coming into their life. They're dealing with hard things that are the direct result of their poor decision making because of their sin. And they contact and they reach out to somebody and they want someone to just say it's okay or give them some kind of a formula or pull out the Bible like it's some magic wand and just, you know, bitty boppity boo and sprinkle some dust on it and, and just make everything better. It doesn't work like that. Just because you're serving God, that's no guarantee of, 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 a, of a happy life. There might be some real suffering. I know we've talked about this recently in, in other sermons about the fact that suffering comes in different shapes 
and forms, but it's bound to come to all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. And here's the thing. God would rather have you holy than happy. And if you're having to be uncomfortable and suffering and unhappy is what's going to make you holy for God, that's what He's going to do. Amen. He's going to bring into your life whatever He needs to to keep you holy, even if it means making you unhappy. So if that ever if that ever happens to us, if it ever comes down and falls out onto us like that, you know we should at least be thankful that God cares enough about us to want to see us stay right, <coughs> even if it means having to suffer at the hands of, of a wicked person or, or being imprisoned or constrained. It goes on and says in verse eleven, and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel. I mean, what? Thanks. <laughs> So glad to have that. Well, now what? What are you going to do with that? You know. And she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when people had heard thereof, they followed him on the foot, on, on foot, out of the cities. I like Jesus' reaction here. You know, he doesn't stop everything, go to the funeral, lament. You know. Jesus just, his reaction to bad news, I'm sure it bothered him, I'm sure he wasn't happy about it. He wasn't, certainly wasn't taken off guard. He, he knew what was going to happen. But he shows us an example, and maybe this is why it fell out to John like this. Maybe that's why John had to go through what he went through, so that we could learn how to handle bad news when it comes our way, when we hear of a tragedy taking place. It's to understand, you know, as callous as it might sound, the show must go on. You know, the work cannot stop. Yeah. Casualties cannot stop the mission. I mean, think about a war. You know, if we were involved in a war, in warfare, and we were to go out and fight some battle, and the enemy fires back and somebody gets killed, do you think the general's going to say, whoa, stop everything. Someone just got shot. Let's all go home. That's not going to happen. They're going to say, press on, charge, take the hill. You know, whatever, take, you know, muster all the men you can and take over that hill. You know, get as much, let put people out there to, to absorb the bullets so we can win this battle because they understand that the, the the cause is greater than any just one individual. That's not to say that John the Baptist wasn't an important person or didn't play a part that anybody is, but Jesus understood that casualties cannot stop the mission. The work of God must go on, and that's something to remember when you're involved in a ministry, when you're involved in a church. When you're going to see people come and they're going to go, they're going to have things um, befall them. People are going to get, uh, you know, creep in, and bad things will happen. And there's going to be difficult times in a ministry. But that can't, the, the wheels can't stop, come to a grinding halt just because, you know, some heretic creeps in or, or somebody goes off the rails in some way or whatever happens. The church and the work and the mission of God has to continue. It has to go forward. And that's what we see here with Jesus. He continues to push forward and work, go on with the work of God. It says in verse 14, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them and healed their sick. You see, Jesus understood He couldn't do anything for John. I mean, as God, human, you know, God speaking, yeah, He could have. I mean, He could have reattached the head and resurrected Him and done a great miracle, but you know, Jesus also, in, in, in the humanity, in the, in, as a man, understood that, as an example to us, that sometimes there's just things that are beyond our control, and it's not, you know, we could sit and fret and worry and bite our nails, but it's not going to change anything. Mm -hmm. And if we spend too much time worrying about things beyond our control, we're not going to see the multitude. You know, we're not going to be moved with compassion. John, you know, Jesus couldn't do anything for John. So what's he do? He focuses on those that he could help. He sees the multitude and says, you know what, I can't do anything for John, but I can help these people. And that's the way, that's the attitude that we have to have. You know, we, we think about uh, people that we want to see saved, you know, that have hardened their hearts or are resistant to the truth, and it just seems like we can't get through to them. And, you know, we can sit there and focus on that, or we can look at all the people that are, we're surrounded by in, in these, this community and say, well, let's be moved with compassion on these people. I mean, we saw, you know, over a dozen people get saved in the last few days. Amen. You know, and that was because people weren't sitting around, you know, worrying about things beyond their control, or trying to beat their head against the wall, or spent wasting their time on people that, that don't want to hear it right now. They saw the multitude and they moved forward. 
The Bible says in Jude, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling with fire. The Bible says in Luke 10, Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. The laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. It's not that the, the, there's a shortage of work for God's people. It's that there's a shortage of laborers. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. So we need to be focused and do what Jesus did, even in the face of bad news, is to continue to push forward and have compassion and, 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 and continue to accomplish the work of God. Let's go ahead and look at uh, verse 15, moving on, where it says, And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the village, villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. They say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and his disciples to the multitude. Now that's one of the most amazing you know, miracles. I mean, I think sometimes we, just, we get so used to reading or hearing about this. But to actually stop and kind of think, how did this actually take place? I mean, imagine Jesus breaking that bread and handing to him, and then just breaking that bread again and handing it to him. It's just the same loaf over and over again. You know, I wonder about That's something I'm real curious about. I hope I get an opportunity to find out exactly how that played out. Yep. Was it in a basket? It just it was like, a, you know, it just kept coming out, just reappearing. It's kind of like the oil, the widow's oil, you know, it just kept coming out, coming yep. out, coming out. I mean, how exactly did that work? I mean, these two fishes. It, it, it's just an interesting thing to think about. Now, another thing that I, I like about this is that we see something here. And if you would, keep something there and go over to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. It says in verse 19, And he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. Right? And we see over here in the, in the parallel passage that it wasn't just like sit wherever you want. That there was actually a real specific way that they were to sit. And it says um, in verse 40, And they sat down in ranks. Verse 39, And he commanded them to make, make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. So it was really uniform. It was really, you know, there's probably columns and rows, and it was so everything could be done very quickly and very efficiently. I mean, you think of everybody's just kind of scattered. It's hard to kind of get through the crowd. It's hard to know, to see who's gotten fed, how far along, who needs, who needs that, you know. It's kind of like the potluck here, right? If we just kind of put all the food throughout the building and everyone had to go over here and go over there, you know, what do we do? We put it all in one spot, everyone goes through another line, you know. And here's a quick, you know, I was talking to Brother Solomon about this. You know, don't be that guy or that lady who's that, that slow person in the buff in the uh, in that line. You know who you are. <laughs> you see all that food and you think, I gotta try, I gotta see what I want. And what's that? What, what's in that? And meanwhile, there's like 50 starving Baptists. <laughs> I mean, you got these Baptists are serious about their father. They want to give that food. They want to taste it just as much as you can. There's always that person who's like, oh, we'll try a little of that. Oh, what's this? Is that rice in there? What kind of bean is that? You know, they want to they want to just see it. I've even seen people go so far as to as sample. <laughs> see if they want more. And I'm going, what are you doing? You know? I, I'm the type, I'm just like, I'm going to try a little of that. I'm going to try a little of that. I'm going to try a little of that. If it looks good, you know, I don't have to sit there and examine the ingredients or wonder what it's called. You know, it's, 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 if it's got cheese on it, it's on my plate. Man, good to go, right? So, because here's the thing, you try a little bite on your plate and you don't like it, you know, no, one's, no one's going around to you finish your plate. It's, it's potluck, right? So, I don't know how I went off on that. But, but anyway, you know, we see here that God is a God of order, that He wants things done in a certain way. Why? For, to, for efficiency's sake, for things to be done quickly and efficiently and effectively. And this is something that we even see all the way back in the book of Numbers. I won't take the time to go through it all, but if you recall Numbers chapter 2, when they were traveling through the wilderness, there was a specific way in which God wanted them to camp. You know, one tribe was to camp here, and another camp, and then another tribe here, and another tribe here, with the with the you know tabernacle in the middle, and the, and the Levites in the center, and they were all given us certain tribes were supposed to be on the north side, some on the east, some on the west, and the south. 
And they were supposed to be stacked out kind of like a square. And God wanted that for a very specific reason. He said, look, I don't want just any tribe wherever they feel like. I want them right here. And he had a purpose behind all that. And it's the same here today. We see it you know, in the Old Testament. We see it in Jesus' day. But it's the same today too. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, let all things be done decently and in order. You know, God wants order in the house of God. Things shouldn't just be, you know, there should it shouldn't just be a free for all. It shouldn't just be open mic. It shouldn't just be whoever wants to do whatever in the church. There's a real specific way that God wants things done, and He lays it out. And I'm not going to take a lot of time to develop that point, but you know, the, the the New Testament church has structure and it has an order of command. And really, that order of command is pretty short. It's like the pastor and everybody else. You know, it's not it's not a, a board of elders. It's not the, and the and the pastor are on some equal footing. It's the pastor is the under shepherd. It's Christ, the pastor, everybody else. Yeah. He is the overseer of the flock. He is the one that has been appointed by God to watch over the flock, to feed the flock, to protect the flock, and to make sure that everything's done in a certain way. And you know, and he's responsible for you know the the, the buck stops with him. You know, and, and it's not, and it's not, and by the way, it's not the deacon either. Yeah. You know, the deacon, you know, and speaking as a deacon, let me just throw it out there. You know, a deacon is just a minister. It's just somebody to help the church, just to serve it. You know, obviously speaking, you know, to some degree on behalf of the pastor and his, you know, what having his mind and what he would think about things, that should be there. And people can sometimes use a deacon as a, as a liaison or a go-between. Yeah. Say, what do you think, pastor? And he can kind of be a go-between to make sure... You know, if that if that's the case, if something needs to be worked out in that manner, but you know, and that's why you know that's why I don't insist upon in a title either that people call me deacon. You know, you don't have to call me deacon. I'm not, a, you know, and I'm trying to get out of the habit of insisting that you don't call me deacon. Some people will say, "Hey, deacon Russell," it just sounds weird. It sounds like <laughs> Corbin, you know, it just it doesn't really roll off the tongue. So, and I'm not, and I don't have to feel like I have to have that title or be called by some something like that because. I mean, is it really that important? You know, just a servant in the church, just trying to do the work of God, just trying to help be a blessing and, and, and do what what's reco required. Now, if people want to call me that, you know, I need to learn to just bite my tongue and say, you can go ahead and call me that. But I like when people would say, what do you prefer to be called? And I just say, you know, Brother Corbin, that's fine with me. Now, if you insist, you know, that you have to call me something, you know, that you have to have some title, I'll meet you halfway, and you can call me... You know, uh, you can call me Deacon or De or Deke. <laughs> what up, Deke? I shouldn't have said that. Now everybody's like, "Oh, what up, Deke?" Right. So, uh, you know, or if you know, you just some people, but some people have to be formal. I get it. You know, some people they just feel that that formality is there. I have a kind of a bad taste in, in my mouth over it because of the fact that some people with our last Deacon, some people were being very insistent on it that we need to call him Deacon so and so. And I was just kind of like at the time thinking, no, we don't. Like I don't see that where it's something that is required. Go ahead if you want it. But some people, are like, no, you gotta call him that. Yeah. That guy turned about to be what he was. And yeah. So maybe that's it. Maybe I'm a little raw about that still. But um, you know, it's, but if people are just genuinely just want to show respect and that's how they do it, you know, fine. I'll meet you halfway. You can call me brother wrestle. How about that? But, I don't know. That's kind of like a. You can use the last name, and then I can still not have to be called Deacon. Anyway, what all I'm trying to make of the point is here is that you know the, the Deacon is one thing, but the pastor is the authority in a church, Amen. and it's important to understand that because there are Deacon-led churches out there where it's it's a bunch of deacons, and they're not biblical deacons; they're just guys who put a lot of money in the plate and and, and got voted in by the congregation. And they're there to decide what color the carpet's going to be, and whether or not we should paint, and whether or not we're going to participate in, in, or have this ministry. And really what they're trying to always do is just rein the pastor in, make sure he doesn't get too wild and out of control, and doesn't, you know, by that I mean preach anything that might upset them, or, you know, do anything that they wouldn't like. So it's really important to understand that they're, you know, God wants things done decently in order, that he has a structure you know, in, with his people. And that structure in the local church begins and ends really with the pastor. He is the, 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 the authority in that church. Amen. You know, of course, Christ being the ultimate authority. But him, you know, and, and of course, even the pastor is accountable to this book. You know, we are as Bereans to search the scriptures daily and see whether these things be so. 
I'm not saying that the pastor just gets a carte blanche, just a license to just do and say whatever he wants. Obviously, he needs to be held accountable by this book. But, I mean, yeah. if, he's, if he's worth his salt, that's not even something you really have to worry about. Well, let's, not, let's move on here. Where it says in uh, verse 20, it says, And they all... Uh, they did all eat and were filled, and they took up the, of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men, besides women and children. So it's not just the feeding of the five thousand; it's five thousand men, besides the women and the children. So it could have been a whole lot more people than just that. It goes on and says in verse twenty-two, and, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. And to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening uh, was come, he was there alone. Now, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting why Jesus all of a sudden, like, you know, he does this great miracle. And then it seems like he's kind of trying to get out of there. It's like, you guys get in the ship. I'm going to go up by my, my way alone. It's kind of like, he, you know, if we read, they, they, they find, the multitude finds the ship missing. And they're like, oh, where did Jesus go? And they go to the other side to try to catch up with him. So it almost seems like he kind of sneaks the, them in there and says, you guys go on ahead. And then kind of gives them everybody the slip and gets up there alone. Because it's Jesus that they're pursuing. So obviously he kind of got away, you know, nobody followed him up into the mountain. Because he was there alone, the Bible says. And why is it, why does it seem like Jesus here is just trying to kind of, get away because it says in John 6 I'll read to you where it says when Jesus there perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king he departed again unto a mountain himself alone so I believe that was kind of his motive there was that you know they, they saw the speeding as the power that Jesus had these miracles that he was able to do and they're like well this guy is going to be our king you know we're going to we're going to set him up and they were even going to take him by force you know, which it seems kind of ironic if they if they if they saw the power that he had, what makes them think they could just go and take him? But that's what they wanted to do. You know, that they wanted to go and take him by force. And really, what we have to learn from this is that we're on God's schedule, not yes. the other way around. Yeah. You know, Jesus is King. Don't get me wrong; He's Lord of Lords. And one day He will come back and set up a throne, and He will rule and reign with a rod of iron. You know, and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Lord is Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. But that's going to happen when God decides, not when we decide. We, you know, we're on His schedule and not the other way around. And sometimes I think maybe we want things for ourselves, even they might even seem right and holy and spiritual and good. But sometimes I think God knows that we really just want that for selfish reasons. That maybe we're just getting a little impatient. That things have to happen for us. We want this thing to happen for us, and it needs to happen now. And maybe God's saying, you know what, you need to put that off. It'll happen when I think it's right. And in the meantime, you know, we can learn lessons along the way. I mean, these people, they had some selfish motives to make him king, right? It wasn't because they, they, they just loved, you know, righteousness and holiness, and they wanted the Word of God upheld and everything like that. I mean, maybe to some degree. But it's, Jesus said, you know, you seek me not because of... of, of you seek me uh, uh, not for the miracles, but for the loaves. He said, you saw how well I could feed you. And now, you know, you, all you had to do was sit down, and we came and brought you the food, and it was, you know, it was unending, and, and there was no limit to my supply. And that's why you want me. It's not because you really want to see, you know, this holiness or whatever. So we see that these people, they kind of had selfish motives to make Jesus king. To the point where they're even willing to take him by force and do things outside of God's timing. I mean, we see that in John 6 where he says, Verily, verily, I say to you, seek me not because he saw the miracles, but because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. That's why they were seeking him. Now, if you look at verse 24, it says, But the ship, so Jesus sends them in the ship, right? And he goes up into the mountain, and it says in verse 24, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. So, Here's the thing. Do you think did Jesus just forget to check the forecast? I mean, he did not turn on the NOAA Doppler radar or whatever, or the radio. You know, I remember back in Michigan, we could. I had this little radio. It was an AM station that it just continually played the NOAA report. And you could find out how high the waves were going to be on, on the on lake on the lakes that day, what the you know the visibility was, the temperature, the, the dew point, all this, and it was just this loop recording, right? Did Jesus just forget to turn that on? Did he just forget? 
that, oh, there was this storm coming. No, Jesus knew that. I mean, he, he's the master of the scene, you know. Winds and, winds and waves uh, obey him. You know, he, he can calm the tempest, as we'll see here. But Jesus, it's important to understand that Jesus knew about this, and he still sent them into the storm, didn't he? And he didn't even warn them. And we don't see him saying, and by the way, guys, you know, make sure you put on your, your, your uh, rubber boots and get your uh, rain gear out and make sure you're all wearing life preservers and be, brace yourselves. There's going to be a, a, a pretty bad storm. I and mean, these are seasoned fishermen. You know, and this isn't the first storm that they've been in. And these guys are getting caught out in this storm. But Jesus sends them into the storm. And, you know, and sometimes it's the same way in our own life. God, you know, like, like with John the Baptist where we saw it earlier, that God allows things to come into our lives and, and, and rock the boat of our life. And we have to say, why? All right. Well, maybe it's so that God can show himself how strong he really is. Or God can come and remind us that, you know, we need to rely and trust on him. <clears throat> you see, he might send us into the storm, but we also have to remember that he comes to help in the midst of the storm as well. The Bible says in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because he seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know, know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. So, you know, we might never be tossed into a literal storm. And we're never going to see Jesus, you know, physically come in a storm and deliver us. But we know that oftentimes a life can take us into a storm, spiritually speaking. You know, that we can go through tough times. And we have to understand that God has not left us. God has not forsaken us. That He will not leave us comfortless. And it's often in the midst of those storms that Jesus will come to us and be... Uh, clo closest to us if we're seeking Amen. Him. He said in John 14, if I go I, I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. So we know that ultimately one day you know, we're going to be delivered from all of this. You know, We're kind of in this, this stormy world and one day God's going to come to us again and we're going to be with Him. So again, you know, the Christian life, it's kind of a theme here tonight, the Christian life, you know, isn't a guarantee of happiness. It's not a magic wand. It's not always the smoothest of sailing, is it? You know, that's why a lot of people don't go for it. I mean, let's face it, it'd be a lot easier to just go live the way of the world. You know, we wouldn't have to have these standards. We wouldn't have to worry so much about how we're living our lives. We could just go about our merry way. I mean, now as God's children, I have to tell you, we probably suffer, you know, the chastening hand of God if we try to do that. Yep. But right. some people are content to live with that. You know, they don't care what God, you know, if God's smacking them upside the head as long as they don't have to, you know, go to church and, and listen to the preaching and try to do all these things that God expects of us and live up to these, these, uh, these commandments that God has given us. You know, because a lot of times that stuff's not easy. You know, living the Christian life isn't always the easiest thing. And sometimes living for God and being part of a ministry that's uh, serious about preaching the Word of God, you know, it's going to bring storms. There's gonna, it's going to make it to where the, 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 the sailing isn't always the smoothest. You know, God rocks the boat sometimes. And uh, it's up to us to just stay in and, and hang on and let Him deliver us. You know, I heard, I think I've even mentioned this before recently, but I, I heard a uh, pastor, I think it was Pastor Jimenez say this once, and it's always stuck with me. You know, there's really only three phases to life, ultimately. He's, uh, he, he said, uh, you know, you're either going into a storm, or you're in a storm, or you're coming out of one. And that's really it. You know, you come out of a storm, you think, oh, that's over. It's like, well, it's over for a minute. But again, mark it down. Life just has a way, especially when you're living godly in Christ Jesus, to lead you into another storm. Mm -hmm. There's always another one just around the horizon. There's always other, something else that's going to come along, you know, and splash up against the side of the boat and, and get your face wet. And What was that? Where did that come from? And some storms are worse than others, but, you know, those storms are bound to come. But if we look, a lot of times, that's when Jesus comes closest and delivers us. It says there in verse 26, um, of course, Jesus came walking on the water, and it says, And when the disciples saw him on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, and as I be not afraid. <clears throat> and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Now that would not, I don't know that that would necessarily be my first reaction. We'd be like, alright, come on over Lord. 
get in the boat. Well, here's Peter taking the opportunity. This is such an interesting story. I mean, what even possesses Peter to test this? First of all, he says, if it be thee. They're afraid it's a spirit. So he's like, well, let me see if it really is a spirit. You know, well, what if it had been a spirit? <laughs> Kerplunk. Mm-hmm. You know, or, or uh, he got out there and it's, you know, something worse than that. You know, for all Peter's faults, for all the times he spoke when he shouldn't have spoke, and put his foot in his mouth, and even to the point where Jesus calls him Satan and rebukes him, and all the things that we see Peter, because he reminds us so much of ourselves, all the faults that we have. I love the humanity of Peter. He's so relatable. You know, he really was, seems to me, to be the boldest of them all in this regard. I mean, he that, that takes some real faith to say, I'm going to walk out on this boisterous, tempestuous sea, and see if this is the Lord, and, and step out and to walk on water. I mean, who would even think of such a thing? To say, I'm going to go see if I can walk across this lake, let alone in the midst of a storm. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. I mean, I can't imagine the way he, what the, when he first put his foot down on that water, and it was like stepping on solid ground. What an amazing feeling that must have been. I, I can't imagine, I mean, if there's anything, I think, sometimes I think about wanting to see or experience from the Bible, that's got to be one of them. I mean, to go and walk on water out to the Lord. And it's amazing. And he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Now, real quick, a disclaimer. This is not when Peter got saved spiritually. This is right. when his spiritual salvation. Yeah. You know, this is not what's necessary for you to be saved. Is to go try to attempt to walk on water. Mm-hmm. All right? That's not how it works. We all understand here it's by faith and grace. You know, the Bible often uses that word save me as in save me from drowning, you know, or, or uh, except those days should be shortened for the elect's sake, there should no flesh be saved, right? There's certain times, certain times the Bible uses the word save to refer to the body, the physical flesh. And that's what we say here. Now, if it was, you know, uh, his, his, his uh, spiritual salvation, well, what a great opportunity to get saved and baptized. Right? <laughs> that was, uh, I thought about it when I was writing. I was like, don't tell that joke. I told it. And it was no. Anyway. <laughs> but what we read from the story is that, boy, Peter starts out great, doesn't he? I mean, the boldness, the zeal, the, the faith that Peter had to even think of such a thing, let alone carry it through and walk out on the water. But what happens? He takes his eyes off God. He starts to worry too much about what he's actually doing. The storm is around him. It says that he uh, he saw uh, beginning. He, he saw the wind boisterous. He saw the waves crashing up and coming around him. And really, that's when we fail, isn't it? That's when we begin to sink in our Christian life. Is when we take our eyes off the Lord and focus too much on our surroundings and wonder how are we ever going to get this done? How are we ever going to continue on? And you know the Bible says in Hebrews twelve that. Uh, you know, we are to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that uh, was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and was set down at the right hand of God. We are to lay aside every weight and the sin which the easily so beset us, and look unto Jesus. That's that's how our Christian life should be. Is that we should always keep our eyes focused on God. You know, spiritually speaking, we should always keep our eyes in this book, reading it, allowing God to speak to us, to work in our hearts and guide us and lead us. Because if we get distracted by the world and we let our eyes wander onto other things and they don't, and they don't get on the, you know, the pages of this book, you know, we're going to start to feel those waves. We're going to start to sink. And then we're going to have to cry out, Lord, save me. And you know what's great about that? Is that the Lord will. That even if you have taken your eyes off Jesus, even if you have gotten away from the Lord and you're not right with God, you know, the Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's right. The Bible says that His mercies are new every morning, that He is long-suffering to us westward. Yeah. You know, God is very merciful and patient, that He's always wanting to restore us back into fellowship, put us back on our feet, to lift us up just like Peter, back onto our feet in the midst of that storm, and say, wherefore didst thou doubt? And get us back on the right path. But we have to keep the end in sight. You know, there's going to be obstacles in the Christian life. There's going to be storms. There's going to be weights and sins. There's going to be things that come into our life. And if we don't keep the end in sight, we're going to stumble. We're going to trip. We're going to fall. And you know what? We might just lay there. Maybe we won't cry out. Maybe we'll say, I give up. 
and just and, and turn away from the Lord. We'll still go to heaven, but we might end up living the rest of our life, you know, shipwrecked. Let's go ahead and uh, look here at verse uh, 31. The Bible reads, And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now it's interesting he says he has little faith, considering what Peter just did. Huh. You know, it's kind of like, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. I mean, it took some faith to get out. Mm. But you know, when he, when he, stopped, he stopped having faith, his faith got small when he was walking out there. That's what Jesus took note of. He didn't say, you know, nice try, Peter. That took a lot of courage. It's like, why, why did you doubt? Oh, the you of little faith. And it says, and when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, thou art the Son of God. I notice Jesus doesn't stop them. You know, they have that criticism where everyone says, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. <coughs> well, he certainly never really stopped anybody else from worshipping him as God. <laughs> and when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out all into that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many touched him were made perfectly whole. I mean, this is probably one of the best, you know, just uh, chapters in the, in the Gospels. Or it's just, it's, you know, it starts out kind of rough with John the Baptist, but the work of God goes on. Jesus presses forward. And what do we see? We see great miracles. We see the faith of Peter. We see all these people, you know, at the, at the end here, coming out, thronging Jesus, the disease being made whole. You know, and none of that would have happened if Jesus, you know, just decided to hang his head and, and feel bad about, uh, about John and, you know, and just, you know, go into this mourning. I'm not saying it's not right to feel bad or, or to mourn things, but, you know, we have to understand at some point that, that life goes on. That the work of God has to move forward. And if it doesn't, you know, we miss out on chapters like this in our life. We miss out on seeing God do great things. Now, I do want to close on the thought there where it says in verse 36, as, uh, and besought him, and that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. What's interesting is that one touch is all it took. When you think about that, um, the woman that was diseased with the, the issue of blood for 12 years. I mean, she touched that hem of that garment just one time and she was healed instantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just a great picture of salvation. Yeah. You know, that we are crippled by sin, that we are diseased by sin, that we are doomed by sin. And if we would just by faith just touch the hem of that garment, you know, as one touch is all it takes. The Bible says, Then said he, in Hebrews, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that the, he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You know, Jesus only had to make that sacrifice one time. Sorry, Roman Catholics. The Bible says it's once for all. Amen. That it's not a perpetual sacrifice. You know, every time you go in there and eat the Eucharist, you know, you can sacrifice, you know, a crucified Christ to yourself anew. The Bible says he died one time. You know, they, they always like to show Jesus hanging on the cross. Well, you know, the Jesus I know isn't on the cross anymore. Yeah. Amen. You know, he came down, he was buried, and he rose again. The cross is empty today. Amen. You know, it was a one-time thing that Jesus did. It was once for all. That's right. Now, what's interesting here is that verse 36, that wonderful verse, where as many as touched him, the hem of the gar his garment, and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. You know, that that that's a beautiful thought. It's a great way to end the chapter to see. These people that have been diseased and suffering, just coming to Christ and you know not having to take a bunch of medication and go through some therapy and get well, just reach out and just touch the hem of his garment. I mean, what a beautiful thing that, that happens here. What a great miracle. But you know, verse 36 doesn't happen without verse 35. Verse 35 is the key to this miracle. It says that when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round abroad out and brought unto him all that were diseased. You know, that's that's what caused this miracle to take place. Is that men had that had knowledge of Jesus got a burden for the others around him and brought them unto Jesus. Amen. And would to God that some Baptists today that have forgotten the importance of soul winning would go back and understand this concept that it's up to those of us that know the Lord, that know where he is 
that know what he's capable of doing would get that same burden and would bring others to him. Right. Yeah. Instead of sitting back and letting this Calvinist thinking creep into their uh, into their mentality of saying, well, if God wants them saved, they'll get saved. Or we'll just keep the doors open and we'll build this immaculate building and we'll just pray that God sends us a great throng of souls. That God just sends a harvest of souls. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus taught. Yep. He told us to go that's right. and to bring them to Him. And that's what we see taking place here. is men that have knowledge of Jesus bringing others to Him. We have to go to them to bring them to Jesus. But not the other way around. So that's a you know a, a something to remember about that great verse in verse 36 where people are getting healed. You know we want people to be healed today spiritually. Yeah. We want them to be saved, but it's not going. It's not. They're not going to find Jesus on their own. They're going to have to be shown who He is. We're going to have to go out to them with the Bible in hand, knock on their door, and get them to listen if they're willing, and show them and bring them to God right. through the Scripture. Let's go ahead and pray.